The Boeing B-47 Stratojet is a retired American long-range, six-engine, turbo-powered strategic bomber designed to fly at high subsonic speed and high altitude to avoid enemy interceptor aircraft. The primary mission of the B-47 was as a nuclear bomber capable of striking targets within the Soviet Union. The Boeing B-47 Stratojet was the perfect strategic weapon for its time, so feared by its enemies that the bomber never had to perform its lethal nuclear mission. Sadly, the B-47 also suffered losses on a scale that would be utterly intolerable today. Over its lifetime, 203 aircraft, or about 10% of the total procured, were lost in crashes with 464 deaths. The B-47 arose from an informal 1943 requirement for a jet-powered reconnaissance bomber, drawn up by the United States Army Air Forces or USAAF to prompt manufacturers to start research into jet bombers. Boeing was among several companies to respond to this request. One of its designs, the Model 424, was basically a scaled-down version of the piston-engined B-29 Superfortress equipped with four jet engines. In 1944, this initial concept evolved into a formal request for proposal to design a new bomber with a maximum speed of 550 miles an hour and a cruise speed of 450 miles an hour, a range of 3,500 miles, and a service ceiling of 45,000 feet. In December of 1944, North American Aviation, Convair, Boeing, and the Glenn Martin Company submitted proposals for the new long-range jet bomber. Wind tunnel testing had shown that the drag from the engine installation of the Model 424 was too high, so Boeing's entry was a revised design, the Model 432, with four engines buried in the forward fuselage. The USAAF awarded steady contracts to all four companies, requiring that the North American and Convair concentrate on four engine designs to become the B-45 and the XB-46. While Boeing and Martin were to build six-engined aircraft, the B-47, and the XB-48. The power plant was to be General Electric's new TG-180 turbojet engine. In May 1945, the von Kaman mission of the Army Air Forces inspected the secret German aeronautics laboratory near Braunschweig. Von Kaman's team included the chief of technical staff at Boeing, George S. Schreyer. He had heard about the controversial swept-wing theory of R.T. Jones at Langley, but seeing German models of swept-wing aircraft and extensive supersonic wind tunnel data, the concept was decisively confirmed. He wired his home office, stopped the bomber design, and changed the wing design. Analysis by Boeing engineer Vic Gansa suggested an optimum swept-back angle of about 35 degrees. Boeing's aeronautical engineers modified the Model 432 with swept wings and a tail to produce the Model 448 which was presented to the USAAF in September 1945. It retained the four TG-180 jet engines in its forward fuselage, with two more TG-180s in the rear fuselage. The flush-mounted air intakes for the rear engines were inadequate while the USAAF considered the engine installation within the fuselage to be a fire hazard. The engines were moved to streamlined pylon-mounted pods under the wings, leaving to that X iteration the Model 450 which featured two TG-180s in a twin pod mounted on a pylon, about a third of the way outboard on each wing, plus another engine at each wingtip. The Army Air Force liked this new configuration, so Boeing's engines refined it, moving the outer engines further inboard about three-fourths of the wingspan. The fin wings provided no space for tricycle main gear to retract, so it would have needed a considerable bolt in the fuselage after the bomb bay for lateral stability. The only way to get a bomb bay long enough for an A-bomb was to use a so-called bicycle landing gear. The two main gear assemblies arranged in a tandem configuration and outrigger struts filled to the inboard engine pods. As the landing gear arrangement made rotation impossible, it was designed so that the aircraft rested on the ground at the proper angle for takeoff. Pleased with the refined Model 450 design, in April 1946, the USAAF ordered two prototypes to be designated XB-47. Assembly began in June 1947. The first XB-47 was rolled out on September 12, 1947. According to the aviation authors, Bill Gunston and Peter Gilchrist, Boeing subjected the first prototype to one of the most comprehensive ground test programs ever undertaken. The XB-47 prototype 
to its first flight on the 17th of December 1947, with test pilots Robert Robbins and Scott Ulster at the controls. It lasted 27 minutes, flying from Boeing Field in Seattle to Moses Lake Airfield in central Washington state. While not experiencing major problems, the emergency hardware system was needed to raise the flaps and the engine fire warning indicators falsely illuminated. Robbins stated that it had good flight characteristics. Robbins had been skeptical about the XB-47, saying that before his first flight, he had prayed, Oh God, please help me through the next two hours. Robbins soon realized that he had an extraordinary aircraft. Chuck Yeager also flew the XB-47, noting it was so aerodynamically clean that he had difficulty landing on the Edwards Lake bed. In February 1949, Ross Schley and Joe Howell broke all coast-to-coast -coast speed records, flying from Moses Lake Air Force Base to Andrews Air Force Base, averaging 607.8 miles per hour. During an early flight test, the Kennedy came off at high speed, telling pilot Scott Olsler, the aircraft was safely landed by the co-pilot. The accident resulted in a canopy redesign and the hiring of pilot Tex Johnston as chief test pilot. The second XB-47, designation 46066 prototype, first flew on the 21st of July 1948 and, following its delivery to the USAF in December of that year, served as a flying test bed until 1954. Its final destination was Chinute AFB, where it was used as a maintenance and familiarization aircraft. The second prototype was equipped with the more powerful General Electric J47 GE-3 turbojets. The first prototype was later retrofitted with these engines. Flight testing of the prototypes was careful and methodical, since the design was so new in so many ways. Both XB-47 prototypes were test flown at Edwards Air Force Base. The first XB-47, designation 46-065, was disassembled and scrapped in 1954, making the second prototype, 46-066, the sole surviving XB-47. In late 2015, the Flight Test Historical Foundation began fundraising to purchase XB-47 for relocation to the Flight Test Museum at Edwards Air Force Base. The purchase was completed in August 2016, and, on September 21st, the aircraft arrived at Edwards Air Force Base for reassembly, restoration, and eventual display at the Flight Test Museum. By mid-1948, the USAF's bomber competition had already been through one iteration, pitting the North American XB-45 against the Convair XB-46. The expectation was that the B-45 production would be terminated if either of the remaining two designs in the competition the Boeing XB-47 and the Martin XB-48 prove superior. It is sometimes claimed that the final production decision was made as a result of Boeing President Bill Allen inviting USAF General K.B. Wolf in charge of bomber production for a ride in the XB-47. A formal contract for 10 aircraft was signed on the 3rd of September 1948. The XB-47, which looked nothing like contemporary bombers, was described by Boeing as a sleek, beautiful outcome that was highly advanced. The 35-degree swept wings were shoulder-mounted, the inboard turbojet engines mounted in the twin pods at about a third of the span, and the outboard engines slightly near the wing tip. This arrangement reduced the bending moment at the wing's roots, saving structural weight. The engine's mass acted as counterflutter weights. Its maximum speed was limited to 787 km an hour to avoid control reversal where aileron deflections would cause the wings to twist and to produce a roll in the opposite direction to that desired by the pilot. The wings were fitted with a set of fuller flaps that extended well behind the wing to enhance lift at slow speeds. The flight control surfaces were powered, augmenting the pilot's inputs and reducing the extension required to overcome the forces involved. The XB-47 was designed to carry a crew of three in a pressurized forward compartment a pilot and a co-pilot, in tandem, in a long fighter-style bubble canopy, and a navigator in a compartment in the nose. The co-pilot doubled as a tail gunner, using the remotely controlled radar-directed tail gun, and the navigator as a bombardier. The bubble canopy, which provided a high level of visibility to the pilots, pitched up and slid backwards. As the cockpit was high off the ground, the crew entered via a door in a ladder on the underside of the nose. 
The extreme front of the nose was initially glazed for visual navigation and bomb sighting, but this requirement was soon deleted together with the glazing. Most production versions had a metal nose with no windows. AK series bombsite provided integrated radar navigation and visual navigation. The optical portion extended through the nose in a small dome. During the late 1940s, the bomber was hailed as the fastest of its class in the world. The first prototypes were fitted with General Electric's J-35 turbojets. The production version of the TG-180 with 3,970 pounds of thrust. Early jet engines did not develop good thrust at low speeds, so to assist the takeoff when heavily loaded, the B-47 had provisions for fitting solid-fuel rocket-assisted takeoff or radar rockets, each generating roughly 1,000 pounds of static thrust. Early aircraft had mounts for nine radar units built into each side of the rear fuselage, arranged in three rows with three bottles. Most of the space within the upper fuselage was taken up by self-sealing fuel tanks, the wing had it been deemed unsuitable for storing fuel. The performance of the Model 450 was projected to be so good that the bomber would be as fast as fighters than on the drawing board. Thus, the only defensive armament was to be a tail turret with 250 caliber or 12.7 mm AN-M2 Browning machine guns, which would in principle be directed by an automatic fire control system. The two XB-47s were neither fitted with combat equipment nor tail turrets, as they were engineering and flight test aircraft only. The total bomb load capacity was to be 25,000 pounds. Production aircraft were to be equipped with modern electronics for navigation, bombing, countermeasures, and turret fire control. Navigation was more difficult than on earlier aircraft due to the higher speed involved. One problem with the aircraft was that at higher altitudes, where the pure turbojet engines could produce good fuel economy, the wing was very compromised. At the top of the B-47's envelope, about 35,000 feet, it was coffin corner. That means at this level, which produced the most range at most weights due to fuel consumption, there was an envelope of 9.3 km an hour between maximum Mach and stall speed. For the B-47 to cross the Atlantic Ocean, it had to be flown this high. Due to its rudimentary autopilot, the pilot had to leave it turned off and spend up to eight hours diligently monitoring the airspeed and adjusting the throttles to avoid going into stall. The aircraft was so aerodynamically clean that the rapid descent from higher cruise altitude to the landing pattern required dragging the deployed rear landing gear. The relatively high wing loading required a high landing speed of 330 km an hour. To shorten the landing roll, USAF test pilot Major Guy Townsend promoted the addition of a 32-foot, German-invented, ribbon drag chute. Thrust reversers had not been developed at this time. For the same reason, the B-47 was the first mass-produced aircraft to be equipped with an anti-skid braking system. A related problem was that the aircraft's engines would have to be throttled down on landing approach. Since it could take as long as 20 seconds to throttle them back up to full power, the bomber could not easily do a touch-and-go momentary landing. A 16-foot approach chute, drogue parachute, provided aerodynamic drag so that the aircraft could be flown at approach speeds with the engines throttled at ready to spool medium power. On the ground, the pilots used a 32-foot brake chute. The brake chute could be deployed to stop the aircraft from porpoising or mouncing after a hard landing on the front nose gear. Training typically included an hour of dragging the approach parachute around the landing pattern for multiple practice landings. The USAF Strategic Air Command operated multiple B-47 models from 1951 through 1965. Upon entry to service, its performance was closer to that of the contemporary fighters than the extant B-36 Peacemaker bomber, setting multiple records with ease. It handled well in flight, the controls having a fighter-like light touch. The large bubble canopy enhanced the flying crew's vision and gave a fighter-like feel, but also caused the internal temperature variations for the crew. In 1953, the B-57 became operational. It was so sluggish on takeoff and too fast on landings, an unpleasant combination. If landed at the wrong angle, the B-47 would bounce fore and aft. If the pilot did not lift off for another go-around, Instability would quickly cause it to skid onto one wing and cartwheel. Because the wings and surfaces flexed in flight, low-altitude speed restrictions were necessary to ensure effective flight control.
Initial mission profiles included the locked bombing of nuclear weapons. As the training for this imposes repeated high stress on the aircraft, the airframe lifetime would have been severely limited by metal fatigue, and this maneuver was also eliminated. Improved training led to a good safety record, and few crew felt the aircraft was unsafe or too demanding, but apparently there were some air crews who had little affection for the B-47. By 1956, the USAF had 28 wings of the B-47 bombers and 5 wings of RB-47 reconnaissance aircraft. The B-47 was the first line of America's strategic nuclear deterrent, often operating from forward bases in the UK, Morocco, Spain, Alaska, Greenland, and Guam. B-47s were often set up on the one-third alert, with the third of operational aircraft available sitting on handstands or an alert ramp adjacent to the runway landed with fuel and nuclear weapons, crews on standby, ready to attack the USSR at short notice. Crews were trained to perform minimal interval takeoffs, one bomber following another into the air at intervals of as little as 15 seconds to launch as fast as possible. MITO could be hazardous, as the bombers left wingtip vortices and general turbulence behind them. The first-generation turbojet engines, fitted with water injection systems, also created dense black smoke. The B-47 was the backbone of SAC into 1959, when the B-52 began to assume nuclear alert duties and the number of B-47 bomber wings started to be reduced. B-47 production ceased in 1957, though modifications and rebuilds continued. Operational practice for B-47 bomber operations during this time went from high-altitude bombing to low-altitude strike, which was judged more likely to penetrate Soviet defenses. Crews trained in pop-up attacks, coming in at low level at 787 km an hour and then climbing abruptly near the target before releasing a nuclear weapon. One of the more notable mishaps involving a B-47 occurred on the 5th of February 1958 near Savannah, Georgia, in the so-called 1958 Tybee Island B-47 crash. A B-47 based at Homestead AFB, Florida, was engaged in a simulated combat exercise against an F-86 fighter. As was the practice at the time, the B-47 was carrying a single 76,000-pound or 3,400-kilo Mark 15 nuclear bomb without its core. During this exercise, the two aircraft collided. The F-86 crashed after the pilot ejected, while the B-47 suffered substantial damage, including loss of power and one outboard engine. After three unsuccessful landing attempts at Hunter Air Force Base, the bomber pilot had to soft drop the Mark 15 weapon off the coast of Savannah, Georgia, near Tybee Island, after which the B-47 landed safely. Despite an extensive nine-month search, the unarmed bomb was never found. Additional fatigue problems appeared later, especially in the upper fuselage longerons, but for the most part, B-47s were cleared for flight. Although the response to the emergency was ultimately successful, the results were not immediate. Despite a dramatic dip in flying hours, there were 22 more B-47s destroyed in 1958. Not until 1960 did the corrective efforts take full effect, and as the B-52 fleet grew, economics dictated that the B-47 phase-out would follow. By 1966, only 16 RB-47s were left operating. For a time, the B-47's high performance and diligent crew provided the United States with overwhelming strategic advantage, but the experience was a sobering one. SAC learned from it. It vastly improved training and flying safety procedures, and the B-52 quickly became the Air Force's principal nuclear bomber. The final recorded flight of a B-47 was on the 17th of June, 1986, when a B-47E was rescored to flight-worthy condition for a one-time ferry flight. This aircraft was flown from Naval Air Force Weapons Station China Lake, California, to Castle Air Force Base, California, for static display at the Castle Air Museum, where it patiently resides.
thing you'll find it certainly flies a lot different than the airplanes you've been working with before when you get on the front seat even with an instructor pilot in the rear you must have full knowledge of the aircraft its systems emergency procedures its capabilities and limitations. You can pay off with your life sometime. How fast does the B-47 really go? What's the scoop on altitude? Does the sweat back wing really stall out easier? What's the range? Wait a minute, fellas. To fly the B-47 safely, you must learn it thoroughly. Believe me, you can't learn it overnight. So absorb all the training you can get. Absorb it thoroughly. Now sit down, fellas. I don't want to scare you. There's nothing mysterious about the B-47. It's a good plan, a safe plan. Provided you know what you're doing at all times. It has some new features you're probably not familiar with. Features that will present you with some new problems. To let you meet the B-47 and get you familiar with some of these differences, well, let's go back a little in time. As you all know, in the evolution of weapons, instruments of offense and defense are continuously competing for superiority. You build a tank, then you develop an anti-tank gun. You build a bomber for offense, then a better fighter for defense. If it happens to be a jet fighter, then the logical next move is to produce a jet bomber, but quick. Well, that was about the situation in June, I think it was. June of 1943. The Nazis were putting jet fighters into combat. So our need for a jet bomber was clear. An aircraft to be built around an engine. It would have to have speed. More speed than was ever thought possible for a bomber before. It needed altitude. The higher, the better. It had to have range. That was a sore spot, too. For the first time in any set of requirements, ease of maintenance was a priority consideration. Designers and engineers all over the country analyzed the requirements in terms of the data available in 1943. They worked with slipsticks, drafting boards, wind tunnels. 
It was common knowledge that the piston pounders of the day attained their optimum range and performance at a moderate speed and in the lower altitudes. One of the most discouraging features of the jet engine was its staggering fuel consumption. Now, this generated some ulcer provoking problems of range and extremely high gross weights. It was known that a jet engine would deliver its best performance near its maximum speed and at very high altitudes. It would also use less fuel operating under these conditions. In the first model, four jet engines were mounted on a thin version of a conventional straight wing. But a straight wing just didn't have enough speed advantage. To find a high speed wing, the wind tunnel did a free beer business with all kinds of problems. Early data favored a clean wing. So the engines were fitted into the fuselage along with the fuel tanks. The wings still couldn't achieve enough speed. About this time, the Allied armies had conquered Hitler's Europe. Captured Nazi research data revealed that the Germans had developed a radical wing design, the swept wing. The plans indicated that the wing could withstand extremely high speeds. Wind tunnel tests confirmed this fact, but it also revealed some sobering problems of sweep back. By increasing the angle of sweep, you can increase the critical speed of the airfoil. But as you increase the angle of sweep, you decrease the span. Since the range of any airfoil is a function of span, they had to compromise to get the maximum of both speed and range. The wind tunnel and slide rule discovered problems of lateral control at the lower air speeds caused by the tendency of the outer portion of the swept wing to stall first. So the problems of lateral control were reduced by designing large aileron and flap areas. To keep the wing clean, the engines were kept in the fuselage along with the fuel. However, with this arrangement, an engine fire could be disastrous. The insulation required to protect the fuselage and fuel was impractical. The engines were too inaccessible for maintenance, so they were fitted below the wing. When the outboard engine nacelle was added, the problems of lateral control were further reduced. To keep the wing clean and thin, a variety of landing gear arrangements were tried. As the design progressed, the tandem gear came into the picture, retracting the main gear along the center line of the fuselage. This looked like the answer. In order to accept the high load factors imposed upon it during all flight conditions, the thin wing had to be extremely flexible. So the wing was designed to move through a 17-foot arc at the tip. The wind tunnel experiments on this flexible model were severe. The tunnel's wind currents worked the model over in every possible attitude of flight, subjecting it to every speed condition from the slowest up to disintegration. Here engineers discovered some disadvantages of the swept wing, like additional weight for wing structure, tough problems of lateral control at low air speed longer takeoff and landing rolls due to the necessary high speeds. But the speed potential of a swept wing was worth accepting the disadvantages. By November 1945, the present configuration and arrangement was pretty well firmed up. And Boeing began to build two prototypes incorporating a 35 degree angle of sweep in the wing. On December 17, 1947, 44 years to the day after the Wright brothers made aviation an airborne reality at Kitty Hawk Beach, the jet bomber idea went on trial. A stratojet was all set to try its wing. And they worked. bomber designed to have a margin of performance over all other aircraft. An offensive flying machine designed to aggravate the interception problem of fighters and frustrate every possible defense for years to come. It didn't take long to realize that we had the offensive weapon we ordered, that the Air Force had become landlord of the fastest bomber in the world. The first airplanes that rolled off the assembly lines at Wichita were subjected to intensive tests by a composite group of Air Force specialists. They learned the airplane the hard way during extensive, sometimes merciless, operational suitability tests. 
A lot of plain old hard work to learn if it was a safe airplane. How to maintain it. What supplies, facilities, and personnel were needed. The test program paid off in a big way for the Air Force. Sizable dividends in knowledge and experience. For instance, they learned some very important facts about landing. Don't land the front gear first. If you do, the rear gear is forced down and the airplane is flying again at a dangerous angle of attack. Under normal conditions, don't pull the drag chute in the air because it will decelerate the plane into a stall condition and may prove dangerous if the plane is too high. The chute can correct for many things in a landing, such as drifting in a crosswind, bounce on landing, or too fast an approach. However, it should not be used as a pilot error corrective measure. With their test, the men of the project were able to discover many of the shortcomings and limitations of the B-47 early, so that the manufacturer could correct for them and minimize the modifications necessary on the mass production model. Here's a bird that will perform successfully. If you, the people who will make the decisions at the controls, will only spend the effort to learn and adapt to a new set of flying problems and characteristics. That's your mission. When you've completed that mission, you'll be B-47 crew members yourselves. You know, the B-47 is a pretty outstanding airplane on the ground, too. It's covered with maintenance access panels to help the men behind the flying crews to do their jobs in less time than previous bombers required. Packing that handy drag chute is no problem either. It's almost as easy as putting dirty clothes in a barracks bag. Your B-47 needs an amazing volume of fuel for a long-range operation. In a jet airplane, fuel is a critical item. Every phase of your mission plan, range, endurance, as well as takeoffs and landings, gives fuel quantity a high priority. So your cockpit fuel gauges read in pounds and not in gallons. This lets you know at a glance the weight of the fuel available in your tanks, and what's more important, the amount of power you have to complete your mission. Now that you're here to become B-47 crew members, it won't be long until you find out for yourselves that operating a B-47 is an elaborate and serious enterprise. So you plan seriously for every detail of the mission. Just keep in mind that with the high speed and limited fuel, your mission plan for this aircraft has to be right the first time. Now actually, your B-47 mission plan is less complicated, but a lot more critical than mission plans for the aircraft you have been flying. Anyone who has flown the airplane on a few missions will tell you that you can get the complete advantages out of every feature of the B-47 if you will plan every phase of its operation. In the air, you know you're going to be your own flight engineer. Even so, planning your missions in a B-47 is really simpler than with previous bombers. You don't have the old string of problems like cowl flaps, mixture controls, manifold pressure, and so forth but you do have some new problems to consider with the airplane. And you'll have the solution right with you, as standard an item as your oxygen mask and crash helmet. If you're serious with your mission plan, it's like a guarantee in writing that you'll be getting the maximum performance out of the airplane. There's only one altitude for the best range. Since it's based largely on gross weight, your mission plan figures the fuel you're going to use for taxi and takeoff and during climb to altitude. In order to maintain your optimum altitude at all times, you allow for the rapid decrease in gross weight by use of a climbing flight plan. But with a serious approach to your mission planning, you can pretty accurately estimate all the variables and get the maximum performance from every feature of the airplane. To guarantee that you'll be around to collect some of those fogies you're building up, don't be in too big a hurry when you get out to the airplane. It's never a bad idea to start things off discussing the status of the airplane with the crew chief. He won't be around if you need him upstairs. Flying this brute makes large demands on all the plane driving experience you've ever logged. So don't slough off anything on that exterior inspection.
three people who will make this piece of machinery a powerful tactical weapon will spend their flying time in an inner pressurized capsule set high in the forward section. The cockpit checklist is designed to save time and fuel on the ground because every minute the engine runs on the ground cuts a big chunk off your flying range. To complete the cockpit check requires interphone conversation between the three crew members and the man on the ground. Let's have an interphone check. Copilot ready. Navigator all set. Ground crew ready. Ready to check surface control. Boost off. Right hand run up. Left hand run down. When you're flying at high speed, the air exerts an extremely heavy force on all the control surfaces. In this airplane, you have the option of greatly reducing the effort involved by cutting in the hydraulic power control system, the boost, to all the control surfaces. The newness of the airplane, with its new pattern of flying characteristics, required a new kind of control surface, the flapper on. They're practically identical to the flaps in every way, but their function is unique. They're available to minimize and perhaps eliminate a potentially serious problem of maneuvering the B-47. The basic problem is simply this. On a swept wing, the center of lift tends always to shift outboard. At low air speeds, in a stall for example, the still air on the top surface of the wing moves toward the wing tips and literally piles up. With the surface power control on, the flapper on, once extended, will rotate upward when the aileron on its side goes up over five degrees. The flapper on actually spills the still air before it can pile up and create a serious lateral control problem at low air speeds. You don't have to allow any time for engine warm up. Once these jets are fired up, they're ready to fly. They do have a mean streak. So clear the danger areas well ahead and behind the engines and go to it. Ready to start number four. Copilot ready. We're on clear and ready. Energizing number four. Six percent. Start on four. be in too big a hurry to get them all going. There's no easier way to wash out a jet engine than poor starting technique. Taxi out with two engines, the minimum thrust to start a ground roll and still hold down fuel consumption. The problem of directional control while taxiing this airplane is different too. Neither differential braking nor differential engine thrust will steer a tandem gear. So the forward gear is steerable hydraulically with the rudder pedal. The ratio of steering rotation is selected by the pilot. 120 degree swing for towing 
120 degrees for taxiing, and 12 degrees for takeoff and landing. Once you're lined up on the runway, all you need is a final check and power for the takeoff roll. The takeoff attitude of the plane is fixed. You always take off and land with full flat. And a crosswind, you'll use some aileron to keep from listing. The flap rod will be in there pitching, too. You can't pull it off. When it's good and ready, the plane will fly off by itself. You never have to milk up the flat. If you reach your mushing or sinking point before you have sufficient flap up speed, the flaps will stop automatically until safe speed is achieved. Because of the inefficiency of jet engines at low air speeds, the plane requires a considerably longer ground roll. The airplane was designed to have a maximum gross takeoff weight of over 180,000 pounds. Gross weight, runway elevation, and outside air temperature have a large effect on takeoff distance. So, under certain conditions, the B-47 needs some sort of assistance for takeoff. In your mission plan, you determine your optimum speed for firing the unit. When you're ready, they fire simultaneously by a single switch. My Reno. Your fuel consumption can be three times as great at sea level as at high altitude. Since the only way to lean out is to go up, climb to optimum cruise altitude as quickly as possible. Of course, the best indicated climb speed will decrease with altitude. So take it up at the airspeed you figured to be best in your mission plan. From here on, there are only two things that will affect range, your throttle, and your altitude. At altitude, you'll get the maximum range and performance out of the airplane by following the gradual climbing flight path you sketched in your mission plan. So after leveling off, stay at a constant Mach number and a pretty constant power setting. There's something else you're going to appreciate about this airplane. Danger from engine fire is greatly minimized. For one thing, all the fuel aboard is in the fuselage. So if you ever have a fire, all you need to do is cut off the flow of the fuel to the engine and isolate the engine with the fire button and the fire should go out. No CO2 required. In a B-47, you're flying the fastest and safest means of round-trip transportation from a forward base to any target in the world. Speed and altitude are your principal defense. 
you have a comfortable margin on almost everything else that flies. Many times on your missions, you're going to want it to operate as close to the speed of sound as possible, practical and safe. There's an interesting point about that, one I didn't know about before anyway. It seems a curious old German scientist named Mach discovered that the speed of sound varies with the temperature of still air. Now, generally speaking, as you go up into the higher altitudes, the air gets colder and the speed of sound decreases. In the new group of expressions you'll be picking up around here, the speed of sound is known as Mach 1. Your B-47 is built to safely approach a certain percentage of Mach 1. Knowing how to operate within your allowable percentage is going to help you become one of those ripe old pilots someday. The percentage you are allowed is about as critical as your paycheck. As a matter of fact, your critical speed is called your critical Mach number. The airplane has a purposeful instrument called a Mach meter, which calibrates your true airspeed in terms of Mach. It saves a lot of mileage on your slide rule and lets you know at any time the ratio between the speed you're flying and the speed of sound. For example, at 0.75 Mach, you're moving along at 75% of the speed of sound at your altitude. B-47 stall characteristics are good. They do have one feature, though, that you'd better dig in and learn all about. An aerodynamic effect called buffeting. On the B-47, it amounts to a vibration all over the airplane that can build up to a violent and dangerous shaking under certain conditions. It starts when the smooth airflow across the airfoils begins to separate in any stall. As the flow separation increases, drag increases rapidly, and the airplane begins to buffet. If it gets to an advanced stage, the controls become ineffective. In a high-speed stall, advanced buffeting means that you're on the edge of serious trouble because you're approaching your critical Mach number. All airplanes have a critical Mach number, but very few have the power to reach such a high speed. But the B-47 has more than enough power to reach its critical Mach. To get the most efficient use of the airplane's capabilities, you have to fly at a speed that is very close to your critical Mach number. You can slip the B-47 right up next to its critical Mach limit and either cruise there safely or clobber yourself. It's your own personal choice to make. If you ever do get in trouble, here's what's happening. As a multi-engine jet jockey, you have to fly inside a couple of rigid speed curves. On one side, your stall speed increases with altitude. On the other, high speed buffeting speed decreases with altitude. The higher you go, the narrower the operational range gets between a high and low speed stall in level flight. It's possible to reach an altitude where you will stall out in level flight. If you do get up against your critical Mach number and into buffeting, it takes time to back off. To slow down in a reciprocating airplane, normally all you had to do was either decrease power or climb. But in a jet airplane, to minimize the possibility of flame out, your minimum RPM automatically gets higher with altitude. So at the higher altitude, even with the throttles back to idle, you will be cruising at a very high RPM. To climb would only put you farther into the corner. Because of pilot fatigue on the return from a mission or pilot error anytime, you can lose track of Mach number and the other variables until you have too much of all of them on your hands. For safety reasons, you have to keep an eye on the key instrument all the time. Of course, the best idea is to realize well in advance that you are approaching your critical mark or stall speed and plan ahead. Letdown brings up another new group of special problems for solutions. In order to avoid the enormous fuel consumption of low altitudes, You'll maintain your cruising altitude much closer to your destination point than in a prop-driven aircraft, practically over your home base. The main landing gear has over twice the total drag of the airplane. 
They act as your dive brakes. The rear gear and outrigger can be lowered at very high indicated airspeed. The front gear is lowered as soon as the aircraft has decreased speed to below 174 knots. Just hold the best indicated airspeed you estimated in your mission plan and come on down. As you approach your landing base, you spend a minute or two checking your fuel and computing your gross weight at the landing point. Once you've figured it out, you can determine your safest approach and touchdown speed. Many times you'll enter the pattern with full flaps and start slowing down as early as the downwind lake. Slowing the B-47 down, even in a power-off condition, is a time-consuming operation because there's no prop drag to help you and the airplane is so clean. We have some pretty strong reasons for a well-calculated approach and landing. Remember this. Every five knots of excess airspeed costs you a thousand feet of runway. Once you're committed to a landing, don't hold the airplane off. For the best landings, you let the two main gears touch simultaneously. But it's still a good, safe landing if the rear gear touches first and the forward unit settles easily on the runway. In a crosswind during both takeoff and landing rolls, you can hold the wings level with the aileron. Jet engines produce a sizable thrust, even at idle RPM setting. It takes about twice as long to go from idle to 100% as from 50% to 100%. So maintain about 50% RPM until you're certain of landing or going around. Remember, there's no lift across the wing from propeller. So if it's necessary to refuse a landing, decide it as early as possible and open the throttle. Since approach speeds are very close to actual touchdown speeds, fly well ahead of the airplane, all the time. The jet engine slow reaction time doesn't allow you the privilege of last minute decision. Plan ahead. Remember, if your decision to go around is too late, you'll have to allow the plane to touch the runway after you apply full throttle. Cut your ground roll almost in half by releasing the drag chute as you contact the runway. It made a lot of good landings and safe landings out of potentially bad or dangerous ones. Remember the chute can correct many errors like bounce, deviation and across wind, or a landing that's too fast. It's most effective at higher speeds, so get it out as soon as you can. If necessary, anti-skid brakes and chute can be used simultaneously. However, it saves a good deal of tire and brake wear if you wait until the plane has decelerated a good deal before applying the brakes. In the evolution of weapons, instruments of offense and defense are competing continuously for superiority. The arsenal of flying machines, the advantage of speed has formerly been the exclusive province of fighting. B-47 is the new concept, the new advantage for round-trip bombing missions. For a long time to come, the B-47 will be the best answer, possibly the best solution, for the largest problems of delivering bombs to targets and getting flight crews home safely.
In the B-47, your greatest asset is speed. If you'll have enough of it at your fingertips to make interceptions by present-day fighters, extremely difficult. The B-47 has a way of flying all its own. It takes a little time and a lot of hard work to master it. But if you honestly like to fly, it's worth it. It's really the best.